Take Back Your Health Now, Episode 36. You're listening to the Take Back Your Health Now podcast, the show that interviews the top doctors, athletes, trainers, and entrepreneurs to help you find the holy grail of health. Now here's your host, Dr. Dan Margolin. Hi, this is Dr. Dan Margolin with another segment of Take Back Your Health Now, where we pull out all the stops in search of health's holy grail. We are very excited to have Dr. Richard Jacoby. He has treated thousands of patients with peripheral neuropathy. Now he shares his insights as well as the story of how he connected the dots to determine how sugar is the common denominator of many chronic diseases. In Sugar Crush, he offers a unique holistic approach to understanding the exacting toll sugar and carbs take on the body. Based on his clinical work, he breaks down his highly effective methods showing how dietary changes reducing sugar and wheat coinciding with an increase of good fats can dramatically help regenerate nerves and rehabilitate their normal function. Dr. Jacoby, how are you, sir? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for joining us. So, Doc, what, what, uh, how did you first get, like, connect the dots here? What made you look at sugar as the main uh, source of health problems? Well, it's really a long story. Um, I was running the uh, Scottsdale Healthcare Wound Care Center about 25 years ago, and I myself had a uh, gallbladder attack hmm. and uh, had my gallbladder out, and my mother had her gallbladder out, and I just thought it was a hereditary disease, uh, as we all have been taught, and eating too much fat was the uh, culprit, according to the literature. Saw my family doctor in the um, doctor's lunchroom, and he had a big pile of food on his plate in the lunchroom. And he said to me, uh, what happened? And I said, well, I had the gallbladder out. And he says, well, that's because you don't exercise your gallbladder enough. Huh. I thought that was a kind of funny statement. And he was sure. a big guy. And I said, gee, that's interesting. A couple of years later, I ran into uh, Lee Dellen from Johns Hopkins. And you may be familiar with him. He's the He's a plastic surgeon and also a, a professor of neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins. And he was giving a lecture and I was there and he said, why do you podiatrists cut nerves out in the foot? I said, well, that's what we were taught. So he said, come on down to uh, Hopkins and I'll teach you what we do and my, my research and literature. I read his textbooks. He's written two textbooks on peripheral nerve surgery, 60 chapters in uh, books and 600 peer-reviewed articles. He's been, wow. Yeah, That's no he, joke. He's, he's Mr. Big in, in peripheral nerves. So he said he had a procedure for diabetic neuropathy, and it was decompression, very similar to the carpal tunnel of the arm and the ulnar tunnel. Right, right, right. So in the 80s, the, uh, he had a patient who had diabetes, and she said, you fixed my arm, why don't you fix my feet? And he said, well, that's not done. He did really interesting uh, experiments on primates and also rat models and looked at the different tunnels such as the tarsal tunnel and the tunnel at the fibular tunnel at the knee and right. and he took really uh, Upton and McComas's uh, basic principle of the double crush theory which go over that I don't know what that is um, well they they were two uh, plastic surgeons that they looked at um, the arm, this is 1973, they published in Lancet, and they noticed that um, the carpal tunnel, which was really not known at that time, uh, just give you a reference background, there was only 12 articles in the um, literature in the 60s for carpal tunnel. Last okay. year, there was 500,000 decompressions for carpal tunnel, just to give you an idea of the magnitude. Wow, of wow. So he said, um, uh, Upton McComas, did a study and they found that when you did a decompression of the carpal tunnel, they also had uh, relief of the brachial plexus and they dubbed that the double crush. In other words, if you released, released pressure on a, one nerve distally, you got a proximal effect. But they also okay. found that 16% of those patients had diabetes. So they, huh. they dubbed that the double crush. And that's the name of my book, Sugar Crush, because it oh, is a okay. crush. And it is uh, very germane to the lower extremity. So Dr. Dowen did these experiments, and he found that double crush was indeed uh, a true uh, dogma. 
And the old dogma, the way we've been taught by the neurologist, is absolutely wrong. Diabetes and diabetic neuropathy, yes, the evil, evil twin, inflammation of the nerve is a biochemical reaction to sugar. And, okay. And what they don't seem to understand in the neurology world is that it's the compression that sugar causes on the inflammation of the nerves that cause causes the pain. So you're saying that the, the sugar, get, let me just clarify. So you, you get, the sugar gets into the nerve, it causes an inflammation. That inflammation, because there's a, not much room, creates almost like a compartment syndrome against the nerve. Is that correct? Absolutely. So there's three biochemical pathways. The first one is the polyol pathway. And that's where sugar gets inside the nerve by normal metabolism, but it, excess sugar breaks down to sorbitol, which is a alcohol sugar. And it's hydrophilic. In other words, it brings water into the nerve and it swells the nerve. That's number one. That's well documented in the literature. Number two is the um, uh, advanced glycosylated end products. And where a protein and a sugar are combined chemically, and they cause shortening of the fibers. So we have compression of the tunnel around a swelling nerve. Wow. Okay. So when I was down at um, studying with Dr. Dellen, uh, I came back to the wound care center and I, uh, this is an interesting story because I came back and I had a patient who I had in the hospital, I would say every year for 10 years, little piece of foot here and there. She was constantly infected. And I, I said to her first name, I said, Janet, I said, I had this new procedure that I learned, but I haven't done it on anybody. And she was in a wheelchair and her sister, which is twin sister had actually died from diabetes. Mm. I said, I don't know what we have to lose here, so why don't we give it a try? So I did the surgery, and it was my first one. I'm sure it's not my best. Sure. And I didn't see her for a couple months. She came walking into the clinic. She was in a wheelchair. Wow. Are you serious? So it, it had that dramatic an effect. Oh, yeah. She came in, but she had a, uh, a sling on her arm. And I was thinking, I was, what, what kind of problem have I created here? Well, she said, I couldn't walk. My husband took me to Hawaii. She was walking on the lava rocks, slipped and fell and broke her arm. And she came in oh. and thanked me because she wow. was in a wheelchair. Very dramatic. So I thought, well, if that works in that bad a case, it will work in most people. And it does. About 85%. Dr. Scobie, just, let's just go back for one second. So this woman, Janet. So the reason she is in the wheelchair is because of the neuropathy? Is that what it is? Yeah. So we've been taught that neuropathy is an inflammatory disease, which it is, and it's caused by that biochemical, those two biochemical pathways. Right. It caused compression. So Dallin's work looked at the tars or carpal tunnel. And okay. when, when you see a patient, and, and it's still every day I hear this, I see a patient with tingling, numbness, burning, uh, loss of balance in their feet. And I say, well, you have diabetic neuropathy, but you have compression in these different tunnels. Let me see your hands. Oh, you already had a carpal tunnel. I'll talk to the hand surgeon and say, well, see, that's a different disease. That's carpal tunnel. Oh, gotcha. Has, I gotcha. They're misnaming this disease. It's the same disease. So after doing about 2,000 of these procedures, maybe less than that, I went back to Dr. Dellen. I said, we get 85% excellent results, and we do. You're saying, you're saying to me that patients with diabetes, 85% of them, uh, I'm sorry, with neuropathy, diabetic neuropathy, 85% of them respond to almost like a decompartmentalization uh, of the nerve? Absolutely. Wow, that's huge. Well, it is huge, and, uh, and I've been doing this now about 17 years, and we don't have any amputations zero wow this is i mean this you know i i was talking to you right before the show and i said you know one of the reasons i started this show is because i've seen neuropathy on the rise i've seen diabetes on the rise and i didn't have the answer right i, I would get a lot of patients that would come in and ask me you know what are the solutions to neuropathy and i you know i would do the standard you know cut, decrease your sugar get it in better control but i wasn't finding that to be a real answer and so 
part of my show is in search of these kind of understandings, bringing this to light. So this is very powerful. I and mean, this really goes to the heart of what I'm trying to do. Keep, keep going with this, but you, you've totally got my interest. Well, I was perplexed. So here I was, I had my gallbladder out and um, fat-based diet versus a carbohydrate diet. Literature says don't eat fat. Now I'm really confused. So I'm, and this is in my back of my mind. Um, you don't exercise your gallbladder enough. So I go back to Dell and I said, um, his first name is Lee. Great guy. We've become really good friends. And he wrote the foreword to my book, if you notice. Huh. Wonderful. And um, he, didn't, he didn't really want to in the, in the beginning. I mean, he's a full professor at, at Johns Hopkins in neurosurgery department. And he's putting his reputation on the line. Sure, sure. So I said, Lee, I, I, I'm really confused about this whole biochemistry issue. And I said, it doesn't make sense to me. If the carpal tunnel and the ulnar tunnel in the arm, and you proved this, and optimum comus brought this to our attention, you did these fabulous experiments on the lower extremity for the fibular tunnel, the carpal tunnel, uh, the uh, tarsal tunnel, and the deep, per, uh, ter, uh, deep perineal ter, tunnel on the dorsum of the foot. And we have restoration of sensation. Why wouldn't every nerve in the body be the same? And he said, well, I don't know about that. So hmm. I said, I'm going to go, I'm going to read the literature. Or actually, I said to him, I said, uh, I'm going to figure that. And he says, well, you just do that kind of facetiously. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so I started reading the literature that uh, I never even heard of these journals, Molecular Biology um, but the one in particular I read was a article by John Cook from Stanford, and it was entitled The Uber Marker uh, of a Biochemical Pathway Called Asymmetric Dimethyl Arginine. Hmm. So it said that it blocked the nitric oxide pathway. So I, this is a true story. This is 2004. So I text Dr. S Dr. Cook at Stanford, never met him. He called me on the phone about 10 minutes later. Hmm. This is amazing. Wow. I thought it was one of my friends just kind of messing with me. Right, right, right. I this all the time. He said, this is John Cook. I'm from Stanford. Uh, that's a great question you have um, on the biochemistry of nerves. Why don't you come up here? We'll talk about it. And I did. I tested 162 patients with asymmetric dimethyl arginine, and I'll explain what that is in a minute. And I, lo and behold, I see that I divided them up into five quintiles with patients who had diabetic neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy, and they were all popping up with many different um, diseases such as uh, MS, uh, optic neuropathy, et cetera, et cetera. Hmm. And I came to the conclusion that this is the same disease. You can call it Bell's palsy. You can call it MS. You can call it Alzheimer's or autism. We're still talking about nerves, neurodegenerative nerves with demyelination, and the answer is sugar. Now, this is, I mean, this got a lot of controversy. So I said to Dr. Cook, I said, what do you think of this data? He says, you got to publish it. Well, I said, Dr. Cook, I mean, he's a cardiologist by training and has a PhD in vascular biology. He runs the, uh, the Cook lab at Stanford. And that is the lab that Gerald Raven started, uh, who is the, uh, the author of Syndrome X, and metabolic syndrome. Yes. That's the laboratory we're talking wow, about. Wow. Wow. So this goes right to the heart of the question of syndrome X. And I'm saying to Dr. Cook, who's the world's leading biologist, that his molecule is explaining diabetic neuropathy. And he says, wow. you need to publish it. I said, where are we going to publish it? In circulation? Uh, it'll take years. I have a practice. I publish it in, in and the podiatry journal, no one's going to read it and no one's going to believe it. So I'm going to write a book and that's called Sugar Crush. Whoa, that's the genesis of the wow. Very powerful. Very powerful. So then I go back to Dr. Dell and I said, you have to meet Dr. Cook. He said, who is he? Well, he's up at Stanford. And, and Dr. Dell is a, he's, you know, he's a surgeon and he, his solution is surgical. I said, I think what we're talking about is different phases of the same disease. So I put them in the five phases. Early phase, burning, tingling on the foot, is really a small fiber neuropathy as opposed to the large fiber 
neuropathy that we do the surgery on. So it's okay. the magnitude of the problem is huge. It's all the same disease. So when you're seeing the small fiber neuropathy, it's presenting as how is it presenting? Burning is the number one symptom. Okay. So, so, so then I, this is this is why it's a quest. So now I have to go back to um, about 2007, seven, and I had uh, my topic for uh, the lecture that I was giving at the uh, Association of Extremity Nurse Surgeons was small fiber neuropathy uh, as the topic. So then I started really re researching what that word really meant. The literature is very sketchy on it, or was back then. So small fiber is really just the autonomic fibers uh, that, you know, hot and cold and sweat glands, etc. Sure. And the C fibers, they innervate the skin, they're unmyelinated, and that is where the burning comes from, especially the bottom of the foot. As the compression accelerates over time, then the larger fibers start to be com compressed. And that's okay. where we get into the motor function and the sensory function. What, what about the vibratory function? Would that be considered the smaller fibers or the, the larger ones? That would be smaller. Uh, so that, so with that, as, a, as a podiatrist, when we test for neuropathy, one of the first things we test for is vibration, right? The, the loss of vibratory sensation. Is that correct? That is correct. But the problem with the vibratory sense, it doesn't tell you which nerve. Right, it right. It only gives you a broad sensation that the foot or the hand is not uh, receiving that waveform. And Dr. Dellen did a lot of work on that. And the Sems-Weinstein is a similar uh a similar problem because we did actually we uh, Dr. Down and myself did a, a multi center study looking at Sems Weinstein. Just, we just, doc, just explain for the audience what that is. That's just the the wire. The, the it's like a thin hair that's pushed against the skin to see if the diabetic or the patient feels the pressure of that. Right. Correct. And Sems and Weinstein they were actually um, uh, speech pathologists, by the way, with uh, leprosy for the lip. Hmm. And that was uh, extrapolated to the foot. So it's a monofilament wire, which is plastic, and it's calibrated in different um, grams per millimeter. And when you press it against the foot, you're asking the patient, can they feel that sensation? Very inaccurate testing. And we found that some patients even said they had sensation when they still had a ulcer in their foot. So I do not rely on that instrument at all. Okay. So, and that's why the, the power of Dr. Dellen's teaching is um, so um, complementary to podiatry. I think podiatrists have the ability and the training and the, certainly the patient population to understand Dellen's work way more than a neurologist who reaches for his pen and writes for Lyrica. We have every modality that we can apply to this disease. So we can cut surgery, we can write for medications, or we can do palliative work, or we can um, we can inject. And so we'll talk about all those things. But the most important thing, we can make the diagnosis much better than any other sub, especially, especially if you understand Dellen's work. So I'm in this quest to figure out what small fiber and large fiber are. And there are other investigators that I bring a lot to this uh, answer as well. Dr. Vinick is a good, a good example, but he's an endocrinologist and he looks at it from a biochemical standpoint. And he actually even made a, uh, uh, a debate answer. And he said, one third of all diabetics will develop compression neuropathies at some place during their life. Wow, that's huge. But he also said in the same article, Dellen's work is not correct. Now, I don't know how you square that circle, but he said that. So he's wow. confused the literature. And the answer is, and with Dr. Dellen and Dr. Vinick, who are probably the world's leading authorities on this, they're both correct. It depends on what phase you're in. If you're in a phase one or two where you have tingling and some numbness, and that's true. It's a, it's a biochemical effect, small fiber, and medical treatment is is probably the way to go. When you hit phase three, when you have constant pain, burning, tingling, numbness, loss of balance, can't sleep, and you've been and you've been placed on a medication like Lyrica or amitriptyline or gabapentin, 
then you're in that phase where you're, the compression is so great that it's causing constant pain. Well, Dr. Jacoby, first of all, this is so fascinating to me. So thank you so much for being on. But when you get somebody that's in that third phase that you're describing, when you release that compression, is the relief immediate? Absolutely. And we call that the test tickle. And what that means is the test tickle means when the patient is in the recovery room, when I tickle the bottom of the foot, they pull away, their sensation is restored. The test. Wow. That's immediate response. Unbelievable. So it, but it's, it's interesting when you, when you couple this thought process with the hand it, with a hand surgeon, and I facetiously do this to them at meetings, I said, so let, let me understand. We have the same patient who has carpal tunnel. And how often, how, how often and how long do you keep them on a medication such as Lyrica? And they look at me and they go, we don't use Lyrica for hand problems. I say, why not? He said, well, we go right to surgery. It's a compression neuropathy. Oh, okay. I said, how many amputations do you have a year? He said, well, we don't have any. Oh, okay. So the same patient... You would put them on, would you go right to surgery? Oh, no, not on the foot. That's too dangerous. So let me understand this. So what would you do? Well, we go to Lyrica. Well, and how many amputations do you have a year in the United States? Well, it's close to 100,000. So oh, if you do, wow. so why would, be, why would there be a different treatment protocol for the foot when you're getting 100,000 amputations and you don't? do medication for the hand, you go right to surgery. That doesn't make sense because they think it's a different disease. That's absurd. So now here's my extrapolation to the absurdity. And, that, and that's what Sugar Crush is about. So back to my gallbladder. So this is really bothering me. So what's the diet? What should I be eating? So I... Look at the literature. So I, I, so I have to figure this out. So I started really digging into the literature. Now, there's a, there's a fellow. And first of all, I have to explain. I shared space with a neurologist for 20 years, uh, Jeff Steyer. He's a Mayo, Mayo graduate, brilliant guy, board certified in three different subspecialties. So we've talked about this for 20 years. So it's not mm -hmm. nothing new. So I, I find this book and it's written by, um, uh, I felt with his last name, D-Y-C-K, and I didn't know how to pronounce it. I said, how do you pronounce his name, Jeff? And he says, that's Peter Dick. Yep. Hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he said, you, I, he studied with him at, at Mayo. He's a world-renowned uh, neurologist. So I got his book, and it's really a tome. And I waded through this book, and it's, it's a tough one. But in the book, it says that 50% of people who have their gallbladder out go on to have diabetes. 50%. 50%. So I go, whoa, I'm in the wound care center at this time. So I thought, oh, okay, I got to start asking a more in-depth history. So hi, Mrs. Jones, how you doing? Oh, I see you have an ulcer in the bottom of your foot. Uh, you got gangrene. Let's go over your history. You had your gallbladder out 25 years ago. You had a heart attack. You had this, that, and the other thing. Every patient I'm looking at, 50% of them have their gallbladder out. So what does this have to do with diabetic neuropathy and ulcerations and amputations? And the answer is everything. So, wow. So now I'm really, really paying attention. So I look at the diet, the fat hypothesis as an absolute lie. And recently, in 19, uh, last November, a investigator in California who is a dental student doing a PhD program found the, the smoking gun, which is not in my book. And that answer is the sugar industry in 1966 funded Harvard Medical School to do a paper vilifying uh, fat. And that's why we've had this fat hypothesis. And then there's lots of other writers that picked up on that theme. Fat is bad, and cholesterol in particular is bad, which in cholesterol, by the way, is not a fat. It's a wax. So now mm -hmm. I'm on a real quest. I've been eating, uh, avoiding fat because of the gallbladder. So here's my hypothesis. 
The gallbladder is, is a muscle, just like my friend said. And it's innervated by the nerve. And that's the vagus nerve. And when the gallbladder does not completely empty, it has residual and you form a stone, it blocks the duct, it hurts, and you have it cut out. You wow. need to be wow. off of sugar, off of carbohydrates because it's inflaming the nerve. So let's compare the gallbladder to the carpal tunnel in the wrist. Vagus nerve to the gallbladder muscle. Median nerve to the thenarin eminence and your index finger and thumb. It's the same disease. Same biochemistry. Same one. It's the same, same one. thing. So then I extrapolated it out to, um, to um, multiple sclerosis. So I had to give a lecture in 2011. So I've been, and I've been corresponding with really some of the top people in the world on this subject. Uh, Michael Hamlin from Harvard, who is a laser uh, genius, and it, on the nitric oxide pathway and, and mitochondria, where, where the real answer re resides. And then I, and I talked to um, Pete Hayden from the University of um, Missouri, and with his theory of conformational disease of diabetes, and Aaron Filler, neurosurgeon from UCLA. All these people have a part of the puzzle, and that's why people say I've connected the dots, because I've asked these fundamental questions. The paradigm that we have been taught for the last 300 years is absolutely wrong. Diabetes and diabetic neuropathy are uh, very well explained by Dellen's theory. So then I went back to Dr. Dellen. I said, you know, I think MS is the same problem. And, then, and he said, oh, I don't know about that. And I said, well, let me explain it. Uh, I'm going to lecture uh, in 2011, which I did lecture. And I put the biochemistry and the physiology and I think the, electro, uh, the, uh, the electoral uh, uh, diagnostic of the nerves, nerve conduction test, the epidermal innervation density biopsy, and, and, the, um, and the molecule that Dr. Cook was talking about, uh, asymmetric dimethyl arginine. I put them all together, I think, to explain the biochemistry of all these nerve compressions throughout the body. So, okay. without get, so when we talk about MS or we talk about Bell's palsy or autism or um, Alzheimer's, they're all nerve compressions. But they were described in the 1800s. They were wow. just, they're wow. just, I mean, Morton's neuroma. Let's go back to Morton. Yeah, Morton's neuroma is a, a nerve compression between the second, third interspace, usually of the foot, right? Usually the third. Exactly. And I did a study looking at that on a prospective uh, study and a retrospective study in my own patients. About 42% of the patients had metabolic syndrome and or diabetes. That's the first compression you're going to see in the foot. That's the clarion sound. That's the first marker. You're getting burning, tingling in that particular tunnel. That's a marker for metabolic change. It does have compression from mechanical causes, as we all know. But it, 42% is very similar to the other studies, the gallbladder. Uh, and when we go back to the carpal tunnel with uh, Upton and McComas st study in 1973, they had 16% diabetic in their study. So, and in 1973, diabetes was not the epidemic it is today. No, absolutely. This is, it's unbelievable. You're just seeing it skyrocket. It's, uh, it's almost an exponential growth. And part of what we're trying to do is figure it out. You know, it's interesting what, what you're looking at. Whenever you find the truth, you always find that there's, there's usually other people looking at it in a similar way. And I've had other, uh, doctors on. I've had Dr. Gundry on, Dr. Joel Furman, uh, other people that have also found the culprit to many of the diseases to be sugar. Uh, so are we all looking pretty much at the same thing? I think so. Then I looked at that question of sugar in depth. Which sugar is, are all sugars the same? The answer is no. Not how they function in the body. And the high fructose corn syrup, I think, is the missing link to this answer, to this question. High fructose corn syrup is, it is a ubiquitous. 80% of all the food in the United States has it in it. Oh, it's all over. It's all yeah. over. And, um, but the interesting part is how it's made. Now, they're trying to change the process of how they make high fructose corn syrup, but it is made with mercury. 
It's made with mercury? I didn't know that. I didn't either. So let's take a look at that. So when you, well, let me let me go through that whole process, how to, how to make uh, this high fructose corn syrup. First of all, it's sucrose and glucose. And fructose is sweet. So they're trying to make a very sweet um, ingredient, and they have accomplished that. It is extremely sweet, and it's in a liquid form. So we grow corn in the United States, and it's genetically modified. And I'm going to try to simplify this. And, I'm, and this is a lot of this works from MIT by uh, Stephanie Seneff. She's an unbelievable investigator. But the genetically modified foods uh, create a change in the, uh, the molecule of the food that we eat. And then it changes our microbiome in our gut. So we're getting an inflammatory process into our gut from the genetically modified organism. We also have a problem with the soil that the corn is grown in because it's artificial nitrogen, which is not the same nitrogen that we had 100 years ago. Hmm. So these little tiny changes cause a massive change in our gut bacteria. So the, there's a biochemical pathway called the uh, shikamite pathway that plants use that's different from what we use but the organism that live in our gut and by the way there's 500 to a thousand microorganisms and we know the genetic content of every one of those at arizona state university which has a marvelous biochemistry department i've worked with them they've figured out the genetic code for all of this stuff leaky gut is true it leaks into your system it causes inflammation throughout your body and it's so, so let's go back to the process of uh, high fructose corn syrup. The corn kernel is separated by hydrogen peroxide. And the catalyst to do that is mercury. Thousands of Oh, my God. Of That's crazy. And a third of the 80% of the food in the supermarkets had mercury in it from a couple studies. So everybody seems to know that amalgams in your teeth should be removed for uh, mercury poisoning. They seem to think that um, autism is related to the vaccinations that use mercury. And we all know as kids not to play with mercury. But no one seems to know the largest use of mercury is in the corn product. I find Dr. that- Dr. Jacoby, rather- you're blowing my mind. Listen, I, I have been, uh, interviewing people about this. We just had uh, Dr. Senef on speaking about how Roundup and, and some of the poisons that are being put in the food are creating autism. Um, I need to have you back on the show. Unfortunately, we're starting to run out of time. Would you, because I really want to go in more depth and you, you've totally like shaken me up. Um, <laughs> would you, would you agree to be back on the show at some time shortly? Oh, certainly. So I'm going to ask you the final question. What, what in your mind, what is the Holy grail of health? Well, I think it relies in diet. I mean, that's the answer. Uh, eating natural foods. There's a big debate on uh, vegetarian versus um, carnivores. We can eat both. But I asked that question to Donald Johansson, who was the discoverer of Lucy, uh, the first primate. Right, right. The answer is pri- uh, processed food is causing the problem. Lucy was really eating bugs and, and fat the more fat we eat, the more human we become, by the way. Gorillas eat carbohydrates. Humans eat fat. And that's the difference in the evolution bio, evolutionary biology. That's what makes us upright. That's what makes us human. The diet, dietary change was a major force in that evolutionary change. So, so just in terms of that, would we, the things we should avoid would be like wheat? Would we avoid wheat or sugars because they convert or what would we avoid? All carbohydrates. You really want to try to get in a ketogenic state, which means no carbohydrates. Can we do that in modern world? Tough to do. If we're going to eat carbohydrates, they have to be complex carbohydrates uh, that break down very slowly and have a low glycemic index. Dr. Jacoby, how, how would people find out about you that want more information? Well, I have uh, a, a website, uh, Sugar Crush the Book, and then I have my own website or uh, email, jacobydpm at gmail.com. If you have questions, you can 
send them to me. Dr. Jacoby, I want to thank you so much for being on the show, sir. I, I definitely want to have you back if you're uh, willing to do so. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. This episode is sponsored by New Jersey Foot and Ankle Center in Oradell, New Jersey. Remember, when you have a foot problem, you've got a foot doctor in the family. Weekend and evening appointments are available. Call us at 201-261-9445. Once again, that's 201-261-9445. Nine four four five. Thanks for listening. Check out the show notes over at drdanspeaks.com. If you're loving the show, head over to iTunes and leave us a review, and we'll catch you next time. Voiceovers for this episode were provided by Randy Ramos Jr. To see and hear more of his work, visit randyramosjr.com. Jr.com. Jr.com. Jr.com.